Okay, so end of day. Um, there is one more, so the bottles haven't started opening yet, but as uh, one of my coworkers was kind enough to point out to me, I think uh, we are the only thing standing between you and some cocktails. So we'll try to get started in, uh, and get going and move things along, which I'm sure will be appreciated. So we're all here today to talk about the who, what, where, and how of engaging European physicians socially. So uh, I'm Jordan Grafman, Executive Vice President of Global Commercial Development at CERMO. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with CERMO, uh, CERMO is a global HCP platform known for delivering uh, HCP insights and deep, meaningful HCP engagements. Uh, I've been with CERMO uh, for about two and a half years. Uh, prior to that, I've spent about 20 in media, advertising, and promotion. This is my very first Next Pharma, uh, and first time in Croatia, so super excited to be here and uh, be with all of you. Uh, joining me on stage is uh, Dr. Ekendayu, so I'd yeah. like to invite you to say a few words. Um, thanks a lot, Jordan. Um, my name is um, Dr. Ekendayu. I am originally from Nigeria, and I currently live and work in the UK. I'm a GP, um, so a general practitioner, and I've got a little portfolio of what I do. I work in primary care, um, urgent care, and I do a little bit of medical assessment um, for vaccine damage, which is quite interesting. Um, the other thing is I also consult for CERMO as a member of the Medical Advisory Board. And I have been doing that for a little over two and a half years now. Um, and I am actually an active CERMO user, which I've been for about four years. And I'm happy to be here today. First time in Croatia as well, and first time at the next Pharma Summit. Um, yeah, and happy to share my insights as to um, healthcare and whatever you ask, whatever, whatever questions. Whatever I you ask you. Yeah. <laughs> Terrific. All right. Well, um, as I mentioned, CERMO's uh, sitting on a ton of really great insights thanks to 20 years of history, peer-to-peer uh, -peer platform engagements. So what we thought we would do is share some of those insights with you all around the who, what, where, and how uh, we're engaging physicians socially. So with that, let's kick things off with the who. So we know there are about 1.8 million practicing European physicians uh, that are actively engaged and, so, uh, uh, actively engaged and socially savvy. Um, we know from a myriad of data that we're able to sit on and collect that roughly about 56% of physicians are interacting with social about one time per week. Um, however, about 37% of physicians are engaging in content, whether they're posting, commenting, or participating in polls um, uh, multiple times per week compared to 9%, which is the industry average. So, you know, what we're seeing is that physicians are a lot more active and a lot more engaged socially. Further, what we've seen is that roughly about 65% of physicians are now turning to social as a meaningful prof uh, platform for professional use, and as many as 62% have cited that they've actually been influenced in their treatment decision making based upon activity and messaging that they've seen on social. So moving to the what, you know, what is it that physicians are coming to social for? Because we all use social for many different things. Um, and what we found is that in the case, you know, far and away, physicians are, are looking to stay up to date on what's happening within their particular specialty. Um, they're also coming for specific information purposes. And so what they're looking for is, is they're looking for clinical trial, uh, clinical trial information as well as uh, treatment information. So those are really the things that are driving their behavior the most uh, in terms of coming to social for professional use purposes. Dr. Ekendayu, in your opinion, you know, what is it that you're looking for from pharma on social? Um, so I would say that um, this, this actually is a representative of what I am looking for. Um, essentially, I'm looking to see what new treatment options there are, looking to see what data there is on sort of new clinical interventions that may be available. Um, the next thing I'm looking to do on socials is to network with peers um, just to see if there are any opportunities available, really. But I think that's quite an accurate representation yeah. of my perspective. Definitely a huge opportunity to interact with peers you know, yeah. on a global platform. So Absolutely. that's great. OK, so we covered the who and what. But what about the where? The reality is not all social platforms are created equal. Right? So when we look to physicians for professional use, you know, what are really the differences that they're seeing between open, general social media platforms and then closed network physician-only platforms? And so what we're seeing when we ask physicians 
uh, far and away some of the key differences that they felt that physician-only platforms were able to, to yield were things like credibility, security, value of information, and privacy. So those certainly stood out far and away in terms of values that they're able to get from social. Um, Dr. Ekendaya, from your perspective, you know, what are sort of the differences in things when you think about using social platforms for professional use that really, you know, you're looking for? Um, so I think one of the main things is the credibility of the information that I can find. For example, it doesn't, you don't get much verification on joining platforms such as your traditional social media platforms. Um, so anyone could actually get on these platforms and share whatever information that they want. Um, so you're at risk of getting misinformation, which is quite a big problem um, when, you, when you think about history, uh, you know, repeating itself, for example, when you think about things like um, the uptake with MMR, we're currently facing issues with um, people refusing to get vaccinated because of um, misinformation from years and years ago. Um, so I think um, having some certain um, restrictions of information that might be shared on open platforms is something for us to think about. Yeah, I think definitely, you know, with the advent of social platforms, right, we see physicians building their brand, um, becoming influencers, right, platforms like X, Facebook, there are so many places that they can go. And, you know, not everybody, right, those are public forum platforms, yeah. and there is an element of verification that's missing. So when thinking about sort of the messaging that's on there, right, it's really important. We talked about earlier today when we were talking about you know, AI and, and the information that's available mm. at, at patients' fingertips, right, it's hard to know what's real and what's not. And I think, right, when physicians are discussing that content, knowing that it's in a safe, credible environment, right, it carries some serious credibility. Absolutely. So talking about the who, what, where, so really let's understand, you know, now how do we make that actionable? How do we go about engaging these physicians in a more meaningful way? So what we thought we would do is share what we see are five key tips for being successful with engaging physicians in social. So the first one is personalization, right? We know that there's no question everybody wants their content personalized today. Physicians are no different. And we're seeing this more and more where they are actually um, anticipating and expecting that content to be personalized. So from a pharma perspective, there's lots of ways that we can go about doing this. So number one is segment by, by specialty, Se segment by region, or even segment by previous actions and behaviors. So oftentimes physicians are taking action, they're participating in polls, they're commenting, they're watching a video. If they're providing that information back and we're recording it, it'd be a real shame not to act on that. Similarly, if we're thinking about targeting by specialty, Dr. Ekendayu mentioned that she's a general practitioner. So you know, the information that she's going to receive in terms of how to best treat a patient um, is going to need to be different than the information that a specialist might receive for that very same patient because they're both treating that patient at different points throughout the journey. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that we're really taking the time to segment and personalize that content. Um, when we asked physicians you know, their opinion on this topic, um, it actually came back you know, fairly interesting. As we would expect, 73% say that they expect it from pharma. So they're already expecting it. 82% said that they prefer um, and hi highly prefer uh, their content to be personalized. And then 74% basically admitted that they'll be more likely to engage with your content if you personalize it. So I really can't think of any good reason why we wouldn't personalize it, given all the things that we're hearing and, and seeing from pharma. Mm -hmm. um, do you have anything you might want to add on personalization? Yeah, I think... Or actually, um, you know what, um, maybe an example of you know, something yeah. you've seen that stood out? Um, so one thing that sort of comes to mind is when I'm using you know, open platforms is you get targeted um, ads. Um, but like you said, most of them don't recognize that I'm a general practitioner. So you might be getting ads saying to me about, for example, knee operations. And I'm like, this is quite not relevant. So I wouldn't click it, obviously. Um, but when you, when you get things saying, oh, would you like to know more about this primary care conference, for example, or primary care something, um, it, it, it just sparks my curiosity and I do, you know, engage with such, um, such content. Um, and I think I found, you know, being on Sermo a lot more uh, preferable with getting personalized ads because um, obviously you've got my profile, you've got some insights about what specialty and things I would engage with. Um, so I get a lot more targeted ads, um, you know, 
or surveys to complete, which are quite relevant to um, the specialty that I work in. In which you prefer. Yeah. Right, so more meaningful. Okay, number two. So easier said than done, but you know, try to speak to your customer in their, per in their, in their preferred language. So we know that, that in the EU, right, it's difficult. We're talking about juggling multiple markets, multiple creatives, multiple translations, and with that comes bandwidth, cost, time, approvals. So you know, we asked physicians about this challenge and their opinions in terms of engaging with content that's either in their own language or not. And interestingly, when we asked physicians who spoke English as a second language, their likelihood to engage with English-speaking content and what we found was that only 7% of physicians actually came back and said that they would not engage with English-speaking content, when on the other hand, as many as 52% actually came back and said, you know what, we, we, would, we always engage with English-speaking content. So while it is ideal to be able to engage with physicians in their native language, uh, defaulting to English in markets or where you don't have the time, bandwidth, resources, or budget, will certainly aid in that capacity and alleviate some of those pressures. Mm -hmm. Tip number three, it's important that we continue to embrace an omni-channel approach. So far and away, you know, events and congresses continue to be the primary, most dominant um, avenue for influencing treatment decisions. But interestingly, when we asked physicians on the things that they valued and that mattered most, what we saw was that at the very bottom of the list, general social media, which is obviously very different and loses that credibility piece, um, as well as email marketing, both performed at under 20% in terms of influencing those treatment decisions, where on the other hand, uh, events and congresses, physician-only medical platforms, and obviously connecting with their peers uh, are the most important and most meaningful for those engagements. Tip number four. So campaign length matters. Right, for sure. Um, and we've all heard and discussed, I'm sure everybody in the room has come across the, 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 the concept, you know, content is king, and it most certainly is. But what we've actually seen is that sometimes less is more. And so what we mean by that is that oftentimes in our industry, we've defaulted to thinking that every 30 days we need to swap out and change creative. What that does is it puts a lot of pressure on us to produce lots of creative, there's cost, there's approvals, it takes a lot of toll on bandwidth, and it becomes a challenge. Um, so we have a number of campaigns that have run on our platform over the years, and one of the things that we started to see is that campaigns that actually def ran or extended their life from 30 to 60 or even 90 days actually saw a 24% increase in exposure without negatively impacting engagements. So we're definitely leaning towards the fact of keeping those assets in market longer. It takes pressure off the team, it reduces bandwidth and those challenges. So, you know, we're definitely seeing that as some really great information, and, and we're actually advising all of our clients to try to use that same existing creative for extended periods of time. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Akindaya, from your perspective as a physician, you're obviously the one seeing these ads, mm -hmm. um, this messaging, this content. You know, what, what, what would you say, in your opinion, is the ideal number of times that you feel like you might need to be exposed to content you know, assuming that the brand has been approved and meets, meets all the medical mm -hmm. requirements and all mm -hmm. of that, uh, before you would feel comfortable making a recommendation to switch therapy or, change, or, or recommend and prescribe? Um, I mean, I think once I'm aware of the medication, um, I'm, with, um, with, like with many things, you have to, you know, have some repeated contact with some with some things before it kind of comes to the forefront of your mind, particularly if it's a new medication or if you have to then switch to this new medication that you need to prescribe. So I think um, in the minimum, I would say about two to three times. Um, but like, uh, I mean, like with anything, the more that I see it, then the more I can think about prescribing that medication. Yeah, and sometimes like we were talking about even earlier today, right? Sometimes you're there and you have an intent and a yeah. reason for being there, and that message is not part of it. Yeah. So you kind of have to see it a little bit. Absolutely. And sometimes it, it just pops up. You, you see it, but you don't see it. So you just sort of view it, but you don't really take it in. So I think when you see it again, it kind of jogs your memory to say that you've seen something previously and maybe makes you want to look at it as well. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Yeah, and I think you were talking a little bit about, you know, the video or something that you yeah. mentioned, <coughs> seven minutes or something. Yes, <laughs> um, that quite interesting video, which I had to go back to look at. It was one on anticoagulants that I spotted on Sermo, and it had been there a few times I'd logged on, and I didn't really watch it. But, um, you know, I, I think I then, something popped up. It was one of the KOLs who was talking about this anticoagulant ter therapy. And um, it was quite interesting because it was seven minutes long, but it was quite engaging and I managed to actually watch all of it. So it was, um, but I'd seen it a few times, to be fair, um, before I actually did um, watch it. Before you actually engaged with the, the yeah. whole long form format. Yeah. Well, interesting that you mentioned uh, KOLs. Excellent segue to mm -hmm. our next slide and tip number five. So as we look at um, you know, partnering and leveraging KOLs, right, it's something that we absolutely are seeing that pharma should be leveraging, leveraging, leveraging uh, mm -hmm. KOLs all day long. So you know, overall, 67% you know, of physicians said that KOLs you know, far and away, um, when, when looking for influence on treatment decisions, um, KOLs outperform you know, medical liaisons, uh, sales reps, and um, field, field, uh, field reimbursement specialists. So similarly, um, what was also interesting is that we saw from physicians that roughly 64% are also starting to really, you know, take notice of HCP influencers, mm -hmm. and you know those are starting to shape with them follow. You know, 64% are now following HCP influencers in social, which is another interesting topic in and of itself. So you know, as we sort of you know get ready to wrap things up here, um, you know, one final set of questions for you is um, in terms of you know KOLs. You know, what is it about KOLs that distinguishes them, you know, from sales reps or MSLs, in your opinion, that makes them, you know, more credible or, you know, those me that messaging, that seven-minute video, you know, mm -hmm. more you're more likely to engage and, and that content resonate with you? Yeah, so um, like the previous, um, you know, panel spoke about, the, 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 while MSLs have got their, you know, place in, um, the, in the medication's journey, I, I personally believe that um, there, perhaps you know them liaising with the KOLs, they might get better you know inputs into the medications journey than you know with just a physician, um, and that's partly because I find that occasionally many of them have a lot of information on the phys on, on the pharmacological properties of the medication, and they may not be able to um, you know see the medication through the patient's journey, um, and. Based on that, I feel like because the KOLs actually interact with patients, they interact with um, the medication through the patient's journey, they kind of have an idea of what might be suitable for a particular patient group. Um, I find liaising with them a lot more beneficial for my time. Um, occasionally, you might have some questions, um, you know, to the MSLs, and they might not have the appropriate answer, perhaps because they don't have the knowledge or perhaps they don't have, um, you know, the experience that comes from the KOLs. Occasionally, some of them are very good and they've got like all of these questions from liaison with KOLs, but I find that, you know, when I've got a KOL, there's a, a lot more holistic approach to um, sort of explaining a bit more about the medication, which makes me want to, you know, think about prescribing it a bit more. Yeah, there's, there's really no replacement for experience, no. right? You know, it's one thing to have the information, the knowledge, but that firsthand, you know, patient experience is something that you can lean on and say they're in it. You know, their sleeves are rolled up just like me. So, you know, yeah. it's, you know, it's something that you can trust. So back to that point about credibility, right? Um, <coughs> which, you know, ca carries through and resonates throughout. Yeah. Okay, one last mm -hmm. question for you that, you know, maybe is, is m the most provocative <coughs> of them all, right? And it's something that, you know, is obviously emerging more and more. So in, in your opinion, you know, as more and more HCP influencers are starting to build their brand, you know, with, within social, you know, what, what's your opinion in terms of, you know, their responsibility, you know, for, a, you know, the dissemination of medical information as it relates to, you know, them and best practices amongst, their, amongst your peers? Um, that's quite an interesting thing um, with um, open social media and health influencers. Um, one thing that I sometimes wonder about is the credibility of these individuals. Um, are they verified? Do, are they actually licensed physicians? Because um, it's one thing for somebody to say something, particularly in this day and age with social media, and it's another thing for that thing to actually be true. So it's a question of, is this information actually true? 
Um, and the other thing that comes to mind is um, whether or not um, the, the information they're sharing, the recipients of that information, what are they doing with the information? For example, you might be sharing something that might be targeted to the medical community, for example, and a layman might take that information and misinterpret it. So mm -hmm. that kind of just puts them in a different um, problem altogether, for, um, you know, for all you know. Um, the other thing is, for example, with new medications, um, I'm not sure if you guys are aware with the problems that we've encountered recently with the semaglutide, um, where everyone wants to try it. Even people who have got normal BMIs are looking to take this to, for example, reduce their weight. Um, and it, it begs the question where people need the medication, they haven't got access. Um, I previously mentioned about the vaccine as well, where all of this information um, can be misinterpreted. Um, and I think that is part of the reasons I am quite keen on a closed um, social media platform to share a lot more about these sort of information. Yeah, it's definitely a very interesting topic, one we were not going to solve here. But no. when you think about, you know, these open platforms and, you know, it's very easy. Some of these words are, are easy to misinterpret yeah. and, 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 and mistake the information. And, you know, everybody is, you know, becoming their own best advocate. Sometimes I mean, the got, information is great. Pros, but um, where, you know, patients can get good information and they can take charge of their health and things, but you then get the other end of the spectrum. Well, the information's where, not yeah. right, right. So, you know, sometimes the where, you know, in terms of sh share, where that information's being shared, mm -hmm. you know, there's almost a uh, unwritten rule of responsibility for, Absolutely. you know, physicians, where they're, what they're sharing and where. Yeah. So that's great. Thank you. So that about wraps us up. Um, for uh, anybody who wants to continue the conversation, know more about CERMO, we can absolutely do so. Uh, please find us on the veranda where we can do so with cocktails in hand. Um, be a whole lot better. Um, and uh, you know, if anybody has, uh, wants more information or wants um, some of these stats that we shared, feel free to download via the QR code our white paper, which will have that information and more. Um, and um, a special thank you to Dr. Ekendayu oh, for so joining for us up me. on stage and to all of you for hanging around and seeing us through to the end of the day. You know, end of the day is a tough spot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.